Episode 92, Baby First Stars. And welcome back for another edition of the Syzygy Podcast. My name is Chris Stewart. I'm sitting in the office of Emily Brunsden. She is opposite me here at the table. Emily, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Good, 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 good. We came back after a bit of a gap in the pod uh, over Christmas, which then sort of extended into the new year and lots of stuff happening. We won't go over all of that again, but we came back with the first in a bit of a series of podcasts we're going to do about baby things in the universe, uh, which seemed appropriate because, Emily, you're you're still expecting, I assume. Oh, this is still uh, happening. That hasn't changed since last week. No, I, there certainly hasn't. I hope you can tell from the, the way I'm lumbering <laughs> around. So that's all very exciting. And we're doing a series of baby things. And so last week, we talked about the baby universe itself, you know, from its from its rough infancy of, of huge growth spurts and enormous explosions through to the point at which we narrowly escaped from a dark forever future of just darkness and an expanding void when the very first little pinpricks of light in the universe turned on, the very first stars. And so we thought we'd talk about that today, talk about baby stars, the very first baby stars. But before we get to that, Emily, I just wanted to touch on something. Because before we did take our extended leave over uh, over the Christmas and New Year period, um, we were getting very excited about something. Something was about to happen in the world of astronomy. The James Webb Space Telescope, or the... What did they? What did they decide to call it? The just wonderful, just wonderful, just wonderful space telescope uh, was about to launch, and it was going to launch. Well, I mean, it's been about to launch for decades now, but it finally was gonna, and it was going to launch on my birthday, the eighteenth of December, and then that got put off to like the twentieth or something, and then it just kept getting pushed back, and it finally launched when on like Christmas Day, Christmas Day, which was a big Christmas present for everyone. But we never really got a chance to check in on that one. So how's it been going? Yeah, well, I certainly sat around on, on Christmas um, Day and had a look and watched the, the launch. It was all very exciting. I was going to, and then we all had COVID and I couldn't drum up anyone's interest. So I sat in a corner on my phone watching it and I got excited and no one else cared, Aww. which is a bit disappointing. But <laughs> it launched and it got up there, which is, that's number one, right? Get off the ground and out of the atmosphere Big sigh of relief because there's a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of passion invested in this thing. And so to actually get it into space at all is a good effort. But that's just the first step. Yeah. So that that was kind of, I guess, number one sort of uh, agonizing point at which things sort of gone horribly wrong. Yeah. And it could have just blown up. Really. And there's still, you know, a hundred more to go. But yeah. in terms of sort of, I guess, the risk factor, that was one of the big, big ones. Yeah. Um, and then it's kind of been, it traveled on its merry little way out to Lagrangian point two. L2, yeah. Uh, and it's been got itself into orbit there very nicely. Which is brilliant because it is like it's orbiting nothing. Yeah, you know, it's it's. We, let's let's not go over this in great detail again. But I just love the idea that this thing has reached a point in space where it's able to just do a nice little orbit around nothing. It's just a gravitational little potential well sitting there in space because of where Earth and Sun are, and it just sits there. Yeah. Going, yeah, I'm going to orbit around. This it's got nothing. friends out there as well. Right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Kepler's out there. Yeah. Uh, Herschel. So you know. Yeah. So it's got there. Yes. reached that point, and now presumably it's in the big, we're going to set everything up and make sure everything's working phase, which for James Webb is non-trivial. No. It's not just a matter of turning it on. No, remember one of the big reasons for the extra, I think it was two or three years delay, ended up being because they had trouble unfolding it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a massive piece of highly technological origami that we're talking about here. Really expensive origami. Big mirror that needs to not just sort of flip up, but actually unfold in multiple pieces. And the, the, it's the solar sail, or not the solar the sail, but shield. the heat shield yeah. needed to unfold. Again, sort of almost origami style. A lot of pieces need to work and work properly for this thing to actually go. And so far... Yeah, so far it's, it's actually happening. Yeah, and and actually, there's been a really good communication about what's happening when, and I certainly followed when those major mechanical structures were being unfolded. Uh, unfolded because again, that was one another one of those really high risk times oh. where you know if it didn't work a couple of times Imagine in the lab being here on, on that Earth, team. 
Yeah, just, oh, Ooh. come on. Yeah. yeah. But so far, all really going well. Um, and we looked it up just before we started recording. And they are in a phase where they are basically aligning things, aren't they? They're aligning all the mirrors. All these different parts have to be really precisely aligned so that they all basically point in the right direction and, and turn it into one big telescope mirror rather than lots of little ones. And they're in the process of going through finer and finer fine tunings of those before they officially kind of take first line. Because mm. what you're saying, basically, they're, they're trying to get it down to, they have to overlap all the images from all the mirrors to less than a wavelength in error margin, yeah. which a wavelength for optical light and even infrared light, you know, we're talking about just a few hundred nanometers. So yeah. There's not a lot of wiggle room here no. for a lot of moving pieces. So it's all going well. Come on, James. But I thought, yeah, I thought it was worth just sort of checking in on that one because we were a bit breathless with excitement in the pre-Christmas last pod that we did. And then a lot of time has passed. So it's still going. It's still yeah. going really, really well. Yay, team. Well done, JWST people. Uh, but enough of that. Let's go on to today's topic, which, as I mentioned, we got to the end of last week's podcast where we'd gone through the Big Bang and cosmic inflation, which is nuts, just want to underline that, huge amounts of inflation and as the universe just expanded by crazy orders of magnitude. And various, as it, as it expands and cools, various processes of it's cool enough that we can now form these particles, and it's cool enough that we can now form an atomic nucleus, and it's cool enough that we can now form atoms. And then there was this long, dark period where it's just cooling and it's cooling and it's cooling. How long was it? Like hundreds of thousands of years? Uh, well, we're going to say well, we didn't. We don't really know. Right. Well, we didn't really know exactly how long because you got to sort of take from the release of the cosmic microwave background, which was three hundred eighty thousand right. years. Yes. Uh, we sort of knew that definitely the first star switched on before a billion years right. after the Big yeah, Bang. So much longer, but we don't we don't know exactly. But well, there's we've long got some periods. good measurements now, which yeah. is quite exciting. So today we'll also talk about a recent paper from uh, twenty twenty one, which has started to nail down actually. When cool. did these first stars cool. start to appear? Because as I mentioned, and as we said last week, you know, it could have been just really boring. It could have been Big Bang and then cooling down and nothing. But we're fortunate to live in a universe where the conditions were right, that you could get all of this gas and dust and stuff, or probably just gas at that point, swirling around and then collapsing down to form the first stars. So let's talk about that. Emily, where do we begin? How does that how does that happen? Well, the most confusing part of all this, I think, is that we actually have to begin with something that we know very little about. <laughs> well, okay. Because it turns out to form even the very first stars in the universe, we need to come back to our old friend of dark matter. Oh, right. Okay. Dark matter, which astronomers use a lot, it seems. But as you say, we don't we still don't know what it is. Well, yeah. we like since the last time we talked about dark matter, this hasn't been solved. I'm assuming uh, no. no one's no one's come out with oh, it's that. Of course, no, we didn't miss a few Nobel prizes. No? Go there. Uh, okay, so dark matter. Correct me if I'm wrong. If you look at a hundred percent of the universe's stuff, and that includes matter and energy in all its forms, then the stuff that we see is what less than five percent. Yeah, is that right? So the, the and that includes the sort of the the atomy bits, the stuff that we're all made of. All the stars that we can see, um, all the light, you know, all that energy and all of that. So that just makes up like less than 5% yeah. of what we would count to be 100% of the universe. And then we've got dark matter, which is, is about 25, quarter, yeah, something like that. About a percent, quarter. Yeah. And we don't know what that is. It, it interacts through gravity, but beyond that seems to be nothing else yeah. or... If there is some other way that it interacts, we, we haven't seen it yet. We know a lot of the things that it does. Yeah. So we can sort of observe it indirectly because of its effects on other things in the universe, which kind of helps quite a lot. But all of those effects are gravitational, yes. aren't they? Yeah. 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 So it's got clear gravitational influence on scales of sort of galaxies and upwards. Yeah. Do we ever see it at scales smaller than galaxy level? Not really, no. We see it, the smallest that we can really measure it pretty accurately is looking at how galaxies rotate and they rotate too fast because they've got too much dark matter right. in them, basically. Right, okay. So we 
we know it's there. We just don't know what it is. And that's like a quarter of everything. We don't know what it is. And then there's dark energy. And we won't like to sort of spend too much time on that. But I just want to point out, that's like 70% plus. That's the rest. Yeah. And we don't even know what that is. But so... there is a big difference about how much we know. We know an awful lot more, probably orders of magnitude more about dark matter than we do about dark energy. <laughs> so don't it's... don't feel too no, bad about it. It's nice to know that even though we don't know what it is, we at least have something. Whereas dark energy is just <laughs> no idea. Haven't got the foggiest what the hell that is. Ah, well. So we're going to start with dark energy. Got a little sidetracked there. Sorry. Sorry. Dark matter. Where where does that come into the earliest stars? Yeah. Well, let's carry on from the cooling, expanding universe that we had yep. from the last episode. So when things are very uh, hot and they're sort of cooling down, if you have electromagnetic interactions, which is how the matter that we are familiar with interacts, so the gas clouds of hydrogen and so on, they they can't collapse incredibly quickly because they're quite hot. They're interacting kind of – the the, you know they've got to take some energy out of them basically right, right and the only way you can take energy out of say a collapsing cloud of gas is to take photons out of it and that's right kind of, so basically. they're radiating energy yeah, yeah. radiating energy is as as light i mean we'd also call it heat but the heat is just a different wavelength of the same kind of stuff so mm. it's yeah it's got to lose photons so energy. if you were to take this idea that you know the ordinary matter in the universe had to collapse down to form the first stars then that would take quite a long time mm -hmm. because it would take a long time for them to get cool enough to radiate away enough energy so that they actually could collapse down into these um, to get gravity to take over collapse down into a star in fact, it's, it's too long, right? right? So the first stars wouldn't form anywhere near early enough to form the first galaxies and the, even some of the most distant objects that we see in the universe. Right. So we have some parameters around this. I mean, what, what you seem to be saying is we know it happened and we have a reasonable idea of roughly when it happened. But if you start trying to figure out how it happened, then we can't make that work. It doesn't, it doesn't quite add up. So you need dark matter is the, the bottom line there. And what dark matter did in the very, very early part of the universe is it collapsed rather quickly. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it was allowed to, I guess, collapse rather quickly is because it doesn't have this electromagnetic interaction. So it doesn't get sort of thwarted by that. So it can collapse down to not small things. We're not talking about collapsing straight down to stars, but we're talking about going from kind of a slightly clumpy but very generally smooth universe which we had at the um, shedding of the cosmic microwave background to quite a sort of structured universe the cosmic web we call it right so this is where you see little sort of dark matter clumps and then they're sort of joined together by these little strings when you say little, though, I mean, these aren't little. On a cosmic scale, it's fine structure, but we're still talking very large things. Huge scales, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so and we, we can simulate this, and we have done many, many different times with lots of really amazing, massive supercomputers where you sort of take, here's all the matter in the universe. Now, give it the characteristics that we understand dark matter to have, play Push play, see yeah. what happens. What happens. And I've seen some of those images. I mean, they are amazing. One of them is probably the chapter art on this podcast right now. So have a look. Yeah, some beautiful, beautiful images. And you can see these sort of, you know, lumpy bits and long strings and threads and, and so on. Like it, it really does give it almost a cobweb hmm. look. Well, it's called the cosmic web. Yeah. I sort of think about it as like a sponge as well. Because mm. if you're trying to look at it in three dimensions, you end up with kind of the matter clumping along these sort of nodes and threads and then you have these voids which are less matter yeah, yeah. so like the bubbles in a sponge if you like yeah i'm just thinking about as you as you're talking about it if if dark matter only interacts through gravity that we know of why doesn't it sort of collapse down to make little i mean it, it kind of does but it makes long strings but i'm just you know i'm imagining the the in, in collapsing down to make stars, like the matter we see doesn't form long strings and things. It forms little little lumps. Why doesn't the dark matter Well, that's a really good that? question, actually. So we think that, so the dark matter clumped down to a size of maybe about a million solar masses. Right. And that's kind of the, the lumpy bits that you see in this cosmic web. Uh, it didn't go smaller than that because dark matter then has the limitation that it can't get rid of its energy in an electromagnetic way. Because it doesn't do electromagnetism. So yeah. it's got energy, it's hot, but it can't lose that energy, at least in the, in the 
the time-honoured fashion of mm. other things, which is, well, we'll just radiate it as heat and light. It's fine. So, no, we can't. I can't do that. It's yeah. dark matter. I hadn't thought of that. So it's just sort of, yeah, it's like a break saying, okay, that's the size that you've got to be. Yeah. So which, which limits it to much larger structures. Mm. Ah, there you are. But it was that whole process because, so the dark matter, we sort of call it cold dark matter because it didn't have this really hot temperature that the ordinary matter had from the kind of Big Bang itself. It sort of had this, it's not really temperature as we know it really. We're, we're, we're being a bit sort of coy here but we call it cold dark matter which basically means it had less energy to try and get rid of these things are relative but astronomers yeah. play fast and loose with words anyway you know metal for yeah. example but let's you know let's yeah. leave that one alone cold anyway, dark matter so it was able to form this underlying structure which then actually all of the ordinary matter because it interacts with that gravitationally was able to then collapse down onto right so it sets the seed yeah if you like yeah okay and it's actually i guess you could call this kind of cosmic web um, in some ways, kind of the ultrasound part of going oh, to okay. yeah, yeah. baby stars, because yeah. this is their very first kind of giving you a picture yeah. of what the what the end product is going to look like. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, if you had an ultrasound at kind of eight to twelve weeks, it kind of looks a little bit like some kind of fish or yeah. something. Yeah, you know, it's not if you quite sort of squint. Is, it, is that <laughs> is that a baby or is that yeah. a lizard? I'm not sure what that is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you know, in the same way, the cosmic uh, web doesn't look like stars quite at this point, but it's on its way to forming these structures. So the cosmic web, the dark matter side, gives you the sort of the the seed structure around which the the visible matter, the ordinary matter, can collapse. But that's still much much larger than stars, star scale. But does that allow it to sort of get to the point where other processes can take over? Well, yes, because now you've got this underlying gravitational structure, so it becomes easier for the ordinary matter to collapse, which right. it can collapse faster than it would if there was no dark matter. And then once it gets the ordinary dark matter, start, well, the ordinary matter starts getting down to these scales, it's got the capability of radiating energy away from photons, so it can c continue to collapse under gravity all the way down into the uh, original first stars. Wow. It's, it's an interesting idea, isn't it? Because... Like my, my my brain is getting a little bit confused by the by the scale of it because like if you think about you know, we talk about it seeding in the in a sense. And if you think about, you know, cloud seeding, for example, the way clouds form or the way you can make rain, put tiny little particles of stuff up into the atmosphere and water droplets can can glom onto them and form form rain droplets and, and fall. But that's going from small to big. And you've you've talked before about the way, you know, planets form. Um, and you can, you know, you have small bits which then stick together to make larger bits, and it's growing bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but this is different. This is this is the dark matter kind of seeding the much larger scale, but getting the the normal matter to a point where the other processes can take over. It's a really interesting idea. That without yeah. that, it just would have taken a lot longer. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you can clump down and you clump down your ordinary matter to the scale of these kind of the cosmic web, which mm. is your million solar masses. Now that then your cloud, let's say, of ordinary matter to collapse into stars has to go undergo, again, this, this energy loss. It won't collapse into one star. No. We don't, we no, don't no, get no. one star with a million solar masses. What you've got is kind of this well, lump. that would be interesting, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've got a lumpy cloud. So in this lumpy cloud, there'll be somewhere in that cloud a tiny little bit, which is slightly overdense because it's not 100% smooth. And that slight overdensity will start to clump a little bit more under gravity and will clump a little bit more and will clump, 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 clump. And eventually that sort of um, million solar mass cloud will give birth to a number of these very first early stars. Yeah, which would have happened anyway, probably, but has happened faster because of the dark matter saying, yeah. come over here. Do it here. Now, the next question, I guess, is so what do these kind of little stars look like? Mm -hmm. And the, we, we know some things, but there are sort of other ideas about how these two stars might have formed. Certainly, they didn't look like the normal stars that we see around us today. And why Why is that? Well, the main reason is because the they're actually made of a different composition to the universe 
to the, sorry, the stars we see around us today. Right, because they could only be made out of stuff that was there. Mm. Yeah. So they're actually only really made out of hydrogen and helium and maybe a tiny little bit of kind of maybe lithium or something. But right. r- broadly, there's no there's no metals in the universe, right? There's, yeah, metals being everything else. Yeah. Yeah. So the Big Bang produced basically hydrogen, tiny bit of helium. That's it. Not a lot else. That's all there is. And does that make a big difference to to stars? I mean, does that does that make it simpler or does that make it more complicated? <laughs> well, it's very interesting because we, we think that therefore their composition is it's obviously different in terms mm-hmm. of the ordinary matter. They may have even had a slightly different composition that the dark matter contributed to as well. Maybe there was a bit more dark matter right. that helped to form these stars and that yeah. was in the stars as well. Wow. But um, the tricky thing is, is that we actually haven't ever found one of these first right. stars. It's a bit, yeah, it's a bit difficult to study something that isn't there anymore. Yeah. So you can only sort of, I mean, guess is probably the wrong word. You can only hypothesize. Yeah, well, there's a couple of things model, we can do. Presumably. We can kind of b- backtrack. Yeah. So we actually have different, what we call different populations of stars, which are a little bit like generations. They're not sort of linear generations, but they're, they're basic, three basic groupings of stars based on their formation the age and and indeed how many metals they have in them how many things they have that's not hydrogen helium right so the obvious one to start with is the sort of the stars that we see around us today the sun etc these are population one stars okay this is a scale that goes backwards and it's always right i was about to say this is one of those ones where one doesn't mean one one means that's where we are one means now yeah Yeah. (laughs) Um, so these are young, typically young stars, what we call, so for example, the sun's about 4 billion years old, compare that to the age of the universe of sort of 13, 14 billion years. Um, we find these stars that were born usually in very rich environments. So that means say the Milky Way galaxy, we find that they were born in the spiral arms where there's lots of gas and dust and metals and all that kind of stuff. Um, or even in sort of in the central regions of the Milky Way, there's a few bits and pieces there as well. And they behave kind of, I guess, as you'd expect typical stars in a galaxy to behave. They orbit around the center of the galaxy, kind of in the, or as the spiral arms move and they go around and they're in regular orbits and they just kind of, you know. They're clearly part of the structure that they're in. They're not doing something weird. Yeah. 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 They were born in, you know, in the Milky Way and they're Mm. behaving sort of fairly as much as they're going to do for the rest of their lives. Sure. Nothing strange here. No. So they're the population one stars. Um, very easy to see. I mean, most of the stars that you see in the sky are going to be population ones, especially the younger, young, young ones, like the blue stars, Rigel, etc. The second population, uh, population two. Right. And so clearly going back in time now to a previous, can you think of it as a previous generation? Well, it's not just a single generation, right. I think is the point. So th- for example... It's a little bit tricky. I think um, estimates have been that perhaps the sun, when it formed, was formed after maybe something like 12 previous generations of stars. Or wow. at least 12 stars had to die to form enough metals for the sun to kind of get the metallicity that it wow. does. I mean, that's and, that's a lot more than I would have guessed, given sun, you said, is about 4 billion years old. The yeah. universe is 13.8 billion years. You can't fit 12, 4 billions into 13.8. So no, clearly but it's not a linear scale. Stars don't last as long. Well, it's not linear either. You don't have to wait for one star to die, then oh, the next star to come along. Mean. They sort yeah, of, they yeah. can overlap and they, gotcha. you know, there's mixing of all the elements and so on. But gotcha. It's like Gen X, Gen Y, Gen yeah. Z, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. You don't have to wait for Gen X to die or Gen Y comes along. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. So, um, so these populations, yeah, they're, 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 I guess, in broad, big, large generations. Like, gotcha. You might even say maybe something on the scale of 100 years or so of human evolution or something like that. So then, yeah, so the population two, these are metal poor, of course, because they were born at a time when there were fewer metals around. Fewer generations of stars had gone through their life cycles to produce the elements that we see. So right. And just very quickly, I mean, the metals, which, again, is everything bigger than helium. Yep. Yep. Um they're coming from where in the in the life cycle? It's different points, but um, they come from part of the uh, fusion processes in very large stars. They come from the explosions at the end of stellar lives, whether that's supernova, planetary nebula. So there's kind of a few different um, ways to create different parts of the periodic table, which I think we did a phone episode on. I'm pretty sure we um, did. We'll dig it out somewhere. Yeah, yeah. for the for the day of the, the week of the periodic table. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, the, the more time goes on in the history of the universe, 
the more generations of stars are producing more and more metals, astronomical metals in the in the universe, which means that later stars are starting with more of that stuff yeah. in them, whereas the earlier stars didn't have it. No, exactly. They only had hydrogen and helium to work with. Um, but yeah, coming back to the metal, these um, population two stars with metal poor, we, we do know of quite a few. Um, we see them, however, in slightly different places in the galaxy, for example. We see them in the bulge in the central regions of the galaxy. Uh, we see them in the halo, just sort of kicking around. So they're not in the places where the new stars are being formed. So why is that? What's, what's happened there? So they either formed um, in a place which was, did, you know, the, the bulge used to have more, more gas and dust or they've been attracted into the bulge. They've been kicked out of the plane of the Milky Way at some point in their lives. Or actually the structure of the Milky Way was slightly different when they formed. It's kind of, it's, there's lots of different reasons. Right. Um, and even globular clusters, for example, which we'll talk about, I think, in a further baby galaxies episode, Excellent. their role in how galaxies are formed. But globular clusters are some of the oldest structures we have in galaxies, and they have these population two stars. Right. So as we're going from population one to population two, we're going from nothing to see here, population one, as you would expect, it's a galaxy. What? Well, it's full of stars. You're looking at them. To population two is, uh, it's not, you know, we're, th these are not the normal stars that we would expect to see around us in the galaxy. These are older, before that structure was set up. Yeah, yeah. And so then you go to, well, okay, there must be, therefore, this population three, mm -hmm. which are the first stars that right. we have in the universe. Now, these are often called hypothetical. Right, because <laughs> we haven't found any. Yeah, I mean, I would say maybe not hypothetical, more theoretical, because they had to have happened. Right. right. I mean, yes, they had to be a first. Yeah. I mean, hypothetical gives them kind of like, oh, maybe they did, maybe, maybe they didn't. They, no, no, no. We, we, we know they were there. We yeah. just don't see them. Yeah. Yeah. So these stars were formed just from the only elements they had around, the hydrogen and helium. Um, and so they had no metals or virtually no metals. Now, we haven't ever found a population three star or one of these early stars. And there's a few good reasons for that, which we'll come back to. But that means that we're sort of working on theory as to how we think they might look like, how they think they might have formed. And so we actually had two really quite distinct theories about what these stars may have looked like. Okay. So we know that they were big because when you don't have metals, then you tend, if you just take a take hydrogen and a little bit of helium, form a star, it turns out to be a huge star. Right. That's... Why And why is that? Is it just because of the relative masses of the of the elements involved, that you don't have heavy things? Yeah, it's to do with how you, you can put your structures together when you've got heavier elements, then you can kind of collapse things at slightly different rates, etc. Right. So just, just collapsing hydrogen, say, on its own with time and helium in it, you get that with a big thing, okay. basically. So they're big. Yeah. So we know they're big. We just don't know kind of are they big or are they, were they really big? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have big stars. Like, we know of really big stars. So when you say, when you say big... Yeah, so the sort of the biggest stars that we tend to see around in the galaxy today go up to maybe about 100 times the mass of the sun. Okay. So the big theory if you like for our population uh three stars is that they were kind of maybe around 20 to 130 solar masses okay so up there with the biggest ones that we see yeah but this is this is like the whole population remember right all of them are like that. all of them <laughs> yeah. are big whereas you know to get to even a sort of 20 solar mass star in our galaxy today is incredibly rare right okay really so really rare most stars are sort of sun or a bit bigger yeah well right? a bit smaller actually Bit smaller. Okay. Yeah, so I think the average is kind of yeah, a bit less, maybe about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 solar masses. Right. Or the most common, but, if you like. But the generation, or the, was it generation three? No. The population. Population three. The population three stars were all like that. They were that. all so that's massive, fun. yeah, yeah. Um, now, if that was the case, and they were all just born at this 20 to 130 solar masses, then they would have gone through their life cycles incredibly quickly. Because the bigger you are, the faster you fuse. Also, because there's no other metals in there, that kind of speeds up the fusion rate a little right. bit as well. And that's because with the, the more mass you've got, the more 
the, the gravitational pull is pulling everything down, which just speeds up all of those nuclear reactions. They can just happen faster because there's there's just more collapse. Yeah, yeah you're hotter, you're brighter, yeah. you fuse faster. Okay. It's just it's all you know. So you're burning bright, living fast, dying yeah. young. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that would mean that definitely we these there would be none of these stars left today. Because even if they formed somewhere in the first billion years of the universe, they would only be around for a few million years, really. Right. Oh, so well and truly gone. Yeah, like so millions of years, not yeah. billions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're long gone. So yeah. that makes sense that we don't see any. Yeah, sure. exactly. So that's kind of one way to think about it. The other one, which I had, uh, had to read a little bit about because I hadn't, didn't know much about it, was quite exciting, was that actually maybe there were some even bigger stars Ooh, okay. <laughs> formed. Because 100 solar, 130 solar masses is big enough. Yeah, you know that'll do. Thanks. So, how, yeah, how, this idea how is that uh, you might form that some that were maybe between a few hundred up to a thousand what? solar masses. That's nuts. Yeah, huge stars. What um, even is that? That's <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just superstar, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> Mega stars. Yeah. Um, and one of the ways that they might have formed would have been with one central big star like this but you might have also had these some little satellite stars that oh, kind right. of formed a little bit like planets which form up from the leftover bits of a star wow. today you might have had a big star form with some little stars forming from the leftover Isn't bits. that wild i mean it's it's almost like it's it's mixing up in those very early stages because we don't have the sort of metal rich and highly structured sort of, you know, galaxy kind of structure that we have now. Um, it's kind of almost mixing the what even is a star? What's a star? What's a cluster? What's a, what's a group of stars? What's a galaxy? Like, it's just kind of mixing together. Going, I don't know. We're just forming stuff. Yeah. Tell me. <laughs> How big do you want it? You know? That's wild. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So these, I mean, the big, big ones obviously would only last, again, a few million years. Mm. I mean, you, if you're on the lower end of the kind of 20 solar masses, and you might last for a couple of hundred million years, but when you're but a thousand then, solar you're masses. well and truly gone. Yeah. yeah. You're you're down to single digits of millions of years yeah, yeah. by this point. Do we have any idea, like thinking about those uber stars, you know, the, the, the really huge ones, like what what does the end of the road for them look like? That would be rather large supernova, right. I imagine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's, I think we need another um, adjective, wouldn't we? Yeah. I mean, we've already got supernovas. We actually already have hypernovae, which are... I think ubernova. Yeah. I think that's got to be what it is. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's really, really wild. Hey, question... As you know, as someone who's who's done a bit of physics, physicists like to simplify things, right? That that you you take the real world and you go, no, 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 wait, that's way too complicated. Take all the complexity out of it and let's just do this bit, which is much simpler and might, you know, instruct us on how the real complex world actually works. I'd have thought that how how do stars work? Well, let's make a model, let's make a theoretical model of how stars work. They're really complicated. Surely the easy one to understand really well is if you say, let's make a star out of only hydrogen and helium. Like, isn't isn't that easy? Yeah, yeah. It just depends. There's so much variation or variables going on in here because you're working in a dark matter halo, which you don't necessarily understand <laughs> very well. Which you don't even know what it is. Um, <laughs> Throw yeah. that ingredient You don't in. know what interactions exactly that dark matter is having with the ordinary matter at this point we know they're interacting they're doing stuff together but um like i kind of alluded to before maybe some of the dark matter goes into the formation of these stars yeah which maybe. that's something we haven't really come across before i mean yeah. we said much earlier on in the podcast that the dark matter is sort of doing really large scale things but that's implying that dark matter is taking part on the on the scale of yes stupidly large but stars yeah yeah and in fact there's even a um a theory of dark stars which are kind of they're, they're actually mostly ordinary matter still they're right. not they're not a star made of entirely dark matter which would yeah be kind of cool what even but, is that <laughs> yeah no it wouldn't work because they can't fuse so no. it's, it's pointless no, no, no. but yeah they're basically stars that have a very high or very significantly higher fraction of dark matter than any of the stars and so on we right. see today and that changes their properties, their behavior, right. how they fuse, etc. So the complication added in on my, on top of my my very naive modeling is, yeah, but Chris, you're forgetting about the fact that we're dealing with a universe which involves a large quantity of stuff that we don't even know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. 
I'll um, step back. <laughs> <laughs> but the cool thing, I guess, about these mega stars and their little kind of baby stars that might have been around them um, is that if those any of those sort of satellite stars were formed and they formed at less than 0.8 solar masses, then they would be around today. Ah. So that could have happened. Possibly. Which means we could find them now there are obviously not loads of them or we would have gone oh it's those those things right we see them all the time tripping over them but we still haven't seen one of them we haven't no oh. and it's a very sort of interesting question of you know would they have made it into galaxies for example or would they have been blown apart by just the the sort of fireworks of supernova that were right. going off in the very sort yeah, of yeah. first generation so of stars. even if they could have lasted would they have lasted given yeah. everything else going on there's kind of one idea that maybe the only way they could have survived for to this day would be if they got sort of kicked out of their matter-rich sort of areas and maybe got kicked out somewhere into a void. Wandering free. Yeah, and just sort of killing, killing time in one of these big cosmic voids, which... <laughs> what a wild idea. Yeah. I mean, could you... Is there even the conceivable possibility of detecting that? Like, surely that would be such a tiny pinprick on such a vast scale. You'd never... Well, that's the problem. Yeah, you're trying to look for one star in the very, very early universe, mm. and that's incredibly difficult. Yeah. Can I guess that that's like no one's counting on that? That's no. not going to happen. No, no yeah, not, right. not okay. on a single star. But, right. you know, there isn't, kind some, of... there isn't someone out there with a telescope going, no, I'm the one. I'm going to find the things. Like, no one's doing this. No. No. But, the, you know, it's a big universe. Maybe a star wandered into a void, lived out there for a while, got caught up in a, in a it would have to be our galaxy, I guess, mm -hmm. at least. Um, later on in the right. piece, yeah. came in for another so merger. So captured again and you could see it. It's not impossible. <laughs> unlikely. It's unlikely. What would it, what would you look for like how would you know how would you know if you saw a population three star well basically you'd only see the fact that they've got hydrogen and helium in right. their atmospheres from their spectrum yeah right so we can take a spectrum of a star and it gives us this kind of chemical fingerprint of what the outer layer of the star looks like and so for the sun we see lots of metals we see everything all the way up to iron species loads of different spectral lines and so we have a very good understanding of what the atmosphere of the sun is made right. of um, and and that's can, a dead giveaway for yeah. a population one star. Population two? Like, can you look at a star and go, population two? You can look at the spectrum. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And you can just see there's just, like, where, where are all the metals? Where, where's all your stuff? Right. And popula <laughs> but population two has some metals, but some. not much. Yeah, exactly. Right, right, right. Very, so, very low abundances. So if you found a star and saw it and went, there's nothing other mm. than hydrogen and helium. And that would be really clear. Right, yeah, because exactly. we know what the spectrum, what the fingerprint of hydrogen and helium are like really, really well. It would be the absence of everything else. There's like, there's nothing there. Oh my God, we've just found a population three. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But it's never happened. No. Hmm. So, and there's, those are some of the reasons why it might, it's not just like we can look around today and say, oh, that star was one of the first stars in the mm. universe and the galaxy we have today. It's kind of tantalizing, isn't it? It's, it's the sort of thing which you couldn't possibly hope to look for but could stumble across. One day it could happen, but no one's counting on it. No. It's just sort of <laughs> sitting there in, in astronomy circles as, huh, I wonder if. Yeah. So we, we do want to figure out more about these first stars. Sure. So And we can't just go and look around us today and figure out which, which who is the first. Come on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who's the oldest right here today? Um, so we have to go a little bit cleverer and do things a little bit more, I guess, broad scale. So I think it's a good time at this point to just remind us about how distance and time works in the universe. All right, buckle in. Yep. And how we astronomers can play the game of let's look far away and we will see things that happened a long time ago. Right, and as a little reminder on that one, that's because it takes time for light to travel to us. And so the further away something is, by the time we see it, that light came from that object a long time ago, right? Yeah. If it's 10 billion light years away, then we saw it 10, as it was 10 billion years ago. Exactly. That's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that works quite well for doing direct measurements of, say, things in the galaxy, things even in nearby galaxies. It's kind of fine. The problem is it gets a little bit fudgy when you do it for very distant objects. So you could say that a galaxy is, uh, like, say, a few billion light years away. 
But the problem is that things are not quite linear when you talk about the very large scales of the universe. Why? So, in, in what sense? Well, so photons, if they travel for a very long period of time, they might go into places which are high gravitational areas, which kind of slow them down a little bit. And then, you know, the Hubble's constant, which is how we measure how much the universe is expanding. There's questions about whether that's even constant on the really larger scales. Right. It's so all it's very not as simple as it's just been traveling across very, very plain, simple, home homogeneous space which is expanding sure but we like that's simple easy just write it down it's no problem no 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 it's been going potentially through all sorts of crazy things gravitational wells and, and so on and we don't even know what the Hubble constant has been doing we don't know what the expansion has been doing absolutely over all of that time so the further back in time the further across space you go the more likely it is that that's not simple yeah right so instead of putting a sort of finite number on it and saying that this is X number of light years away, what astronomers do is they do the bit next best thing, which is much more precise, is they say how redshifted is this? Well, by this time we're talking about galaxies, right? Right. We can't see individual stars at really hard distances. We have to get the whole light of a galaxy put together for us to be able to see it. And we use a re measurement of redshift. So redshift tells us how much say the hydrogen lines in a galaxy spectrum have moved towards the red because the universe has expanded as the time has passed between the photons leaving that galaxy and them arriving to us. Right. This is a little bit like the the sound Doppler effect, isn't it? That that when you've got a car coming down the road towards you, it sounds higher in pitch and then it passes you and goes away from you and it sounds lower in pitch. It's the that you hear. And this is kind of that, that as the universe is expanding and things appear to be rushing away from us out there in the, in the universe, that has a, the effect on the light similar to the car passing us, that the, the, the sound of the car goes down, the light gets red shifted, gets stretched in that particular direction. So we know what the, the particular spectrum lines should be, but they're not where they would be if it were right next door to us. They've yeah. been shifted down into the red part of the spectrum and that roughly correlates to distance, but we don't... Yeah, it means it's a direct measurement. We're, very, we're good at measuring spectral lines. We can make those sure. measurements. We know that those are accurate. And then if you want to apply, say, your favorite value of the Hubble constant to that, <laughs> whatever the Hubble constant might yeah. be, or, you know, your favorite cosmological model, you can get an actual distance if you sure. want. But, you know... So the redshift is... I mean, there's no question. It is here. We have measured that shift... It then comes down to interpretation of, okay, so what does your model say about where this thing is now? Yeah. Sure. So we tend to work in redshift. So we can see the most very distant galaxies, which have to be very, very bright, remember, because, you know, it's just like everything else. They get away. fainter as you yeah. get further away. Um, very distant galaxies we can see are somewhere between 9 and 11 redshift factor. So we call it Z, okay. 9 to 11. And is that's big? It's very big. Right. Right. So that's that's a really long time ago. Um, it's sort of we're looking at, I guess, in the first few hundreds of millions of years of the uh, universe. Wow. So late, late in the late part of that. So yeah. Yeah, up to about a billion yeah. years. So that's a really long time ago. I mean, those those structures are forming, like that's really early when you consider mm. how, you know, how energetic the universe's birth was. Um, that's quite amazing. Yeah. Now the problem is then, so that's that's the farthest we can see with the best telescopes that we have. You know, these the, the, that's as far as we can go. Best part of sort of thirteen billion years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So the problem is that the we believe that these first stars formed around about redshift sixteen to nineteen. That's a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, we can't obviously see individual stars as, at that level anyway. It would only be if we could see a galaxy full of first stars, which is actually a different question that we'll come back to, I think, in, yeah. the, in the next episode. Yeah. Can that even happen? Yeah. I mean, galaxies and stars are a bit of chicken and egg yeah. <laughs> situation here. Well, I mean, what you described before with these, you know, mega stars with their little star buddies, is like, what even is a galaxy when you're talking about that? Like, what, yeah. is, what are we even talking about? So you don't necessarily get this clumping of um, loads of loads of stars into a single object that you can therefore see at a really high distance. Um, but yeah, so 16 to 19 is just outside of the reach of right. telescopes. Yeah, we can't get there. Could we conceivably ever get there? Or is there sort of a limit there on, we're never going to see that? Well, it's a good question. I think we'll get closer. And we're going to get closer actually very, very soon as we'll talk about in a minute. But I don't know. It, de it depends on 
the, yeah. You just need a lot of light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, like you, it's not just uh, you know a few stars. You just can't see a few stars. We're talking about getting hundreds of billions, maybe even um, thousands of billions of stars together before we can see them at these distances. So we could push closer, but could you get that far? Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, so we can we can get sort of most of the way back, but not the whole way back. So there's a really interesting paper that came out last year, which has now started to put some actual full, full, firmish numbers on when did these very first stars form in the universe. Mm -hmm. And they did it in a really clever way. I got very excited when I read this paper. So this is a paper from um, Laporte et al, who published this in June 2021. And they were looking for what they call cosmic dawn, the first stars. You know, when did that happen exactly? So what data we have available to us are these galaxies that we can see um, at, you know, these these really high red shifts between uh, 9 and 11. And with most of them, they, saw, they took about six of these really high red shift galaxies. And they are kind of around about 550 million years after the Big Bang is the kind of their average age. Okay. And they said, okay, that's what we can see. Now, we know that the stars had to be born before that because we see them in the galaxies. Yeah. No. Yeah. But what they were able to do is this really clever thing where they took spectra of these galaxies. And I have to stress here, this is not <laughs> easy. I, we, we say you should take a spectrum of a star as if it's you know the, the easiest thing in the world. And to some senses, if it's a nearby star in our galaxy. Yeah. The sun, piece of cake. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Taking a spectrum of a galaxy that's, you know, at these insane redshifts takes some of the biggest telescopes in the world with some of the best spectrographs in the world. So I was pretty impressed when I was reading that they, they took 70 hours of time on literally the biggest telescopes and arrays in the world. Wow. Right? So we that, got, I mean, that's a lot. Yeah, 70 yeah. hours is a lot. And we're talking about ALMA, which is the massive microwave telescope array in Chile. We're talking about the VLT, the Very Large Telescope Structure that we've talked about before, that was looking at um, black holes and all is sorts of things. Hawaii? Is that Hawaii? Uh, it's also in Chile. Oh, it's also in yeah. Chile. Gemini South, another one of the big mega 10-meter um, class telescopes. Keck, another double 10 meter class telescope in Hawaii. So, you know, these, these they really are pulled out the all big the players. On this yeah. One. Yeah, yeah. You know, if yeah. you were to write a wish list of the telescopes you would like to observe the early universe with, then I think, you know. Just all of them. Can yeah. we use all of them, please? And presumably the problem is that like you, they're so far away and they're so dim that you've got to have a lot of collecting power to be able to get enough light to see anything at all. But then you've also got the fact that because the light has been traveling so far over so much distance and crazy stuff in space, presumably the very things you're trying to measure, which is not just light, it's the spectrum, it's the spectral lines, these things get smeared out. Right. Yeah, well, we're not even talking about spectral lines. We can't, okay. we can't even get to that level of detail. Because imagine, you know, you've got this galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars. Um, you're not seeing each of those as tiny little pinpricks. These are not the Hubble images of nearby galaxies yeah, yeah, with yeah. beautiful yeah. structure. This is a blob yeah. on the sky. Yeah. It's, it's a reddish colored blob. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're going to get from so it. So what are you measuring then? So you're measuring the color. Mm -hmm. So you're measuring sort of how the color distribution of the galaxy is. And you can kind of do what is very low resolution spectroscopy to try and sort of split out how much broadly are in these wavelength regions right, okay. rather than you know a very high um, high resolution spectrum that right. you might see for a, a nearby object right. but that color does tell you something interesting because colors of galaxies change over time mm -hmm. right because stars colors change over time so if you have a galaxy which is very very young that's only just come together and forming stars uh, right now, then it tends to be a lot bluer, right? Because you tend to form much more of these very big blue stars. They're very bright. They contribute a lot of light to the galaxy, but they don't hang around for long. Right. So yeah. you've got to be actively forming them to get a blue galaxy. If you go to a galaxy that's a little bit more old and kind of not forming stars anymore, it looks red because all the big blue stars have gone. They've evolved off and doing their supernova and all this stuff. So you've just got the ready big giants and uh, red main sequence stars left. So just by looking at the color broadly of the galaxy, that gives you information on how long it's been around. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you've got to do some modeling here. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got to be very careful how you model, particularly very early galaxies, because they behave differently because they've got different stuff in them. Sure, right? as if it wasn't complicated enough already. <laughs> yeah. But um, this was, so this work used the stellar population models, which came from a uh, routine called bagpipes. <laughs> They worked really hard on this one. What does bagpipes stand for? I had to go and look at that. It was yeah, hard, to be honest nice. with you. We haven't had one of these in a while. We no. had a stretch many podcasts ago of weird acronyms and how hard astronomers work to crowbar things in. So bagpipes, go on then. Yeah, okay. So this is Bayesian analysis of galaxies for physical inference and parameter estimation. Nice work. 10 out of 10 for the acronym. Oh, I, I'm not giving it a 10. No? No, it's got to come. You've got to lose mark for the fact that estimation, you're using both the E and the S. Oh, look. I think that's all right. You know, you come across somewhere there are just letters inserted that don't even stand for anything. I think that you can give them that. All right, maybe I'll, not give, them, I'll give them a nine. Give them a nine out of ten. A solid yeah. nine. Well done, the bagpipes team. Yeah, and I, and I did actually look at this and I thought, actually, is this something that we can use for the naming of our child? <laughs> it's, I mean, in true astronomical form, my partner's also an astronomer. You think... Um, well, you know, you know, we're going to have a baby. We'd, what would we do if we were trying to name a project in astronomy? We'd go for what's I a what's a clever it. acronym. <laughs> I can't wait to find out because when you tell, I'm now going to be thinking about this. When you do eventually tell me, here is my child and this is its name, I'm then going to immediately be thinking. What does that stand for? <laughs> See if I can work it out. I yeah, we definitely have to can have some good acronyms <laughs> to go along with it. But anyway, so but yeah, so the the modeling uh, sort of routines are called bagpipes, which I, I mean, I don't I didn't actually look into it a lot of detail. I hope that some of the contributors were Scottish. You'd like to think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, at least. But anyway, so what they're able to do is take your colors, your very sort of basic spectrum that you've got from this galaxy and sort of rewind the clock and say, well, what would this have looked like in the rest frame of the galaxy, which means basically in its sort of heyday of mm -hmm. when it was born, et cetera, um, turn that back into a, you know, a normal age um, profile. And from that, they were able to figure out some really cool stuff about the um, galaxies and the stars that are in them. They found out that actually they, the stars were largely born around about 250 to 350 million years after the Big Bang. Okay, which is not long. It's not long at all, is it, no. really? Because you think, you know, that's, we're talking just, just fractions of a billion years mm. out of our whole you know, cosmic history of 13 or whatever billion I mean, years. it is a bit weird to talk about hundreds of millions of years as, oh, that's nothing. But, yeah. but in terms of what's just happened, you mm. know, the creation of the universe, all that, um, that's not long no. to then form what is small scale stuff in the universe. Like that happened quick. Yeah. And in fact, they've estimated that 70% of all the stellar mass, so the stars basically in their mass form, um, was in place by a redshift of about 10. So that's what we're observing. Yeah. Right? So basically we're saying we can see now about with those galaxies about 70% of everything that galaxy is going to kind of have in the future. Wow. We've already seen that. Wow. So. That, is, that is amazing. Yeah, it's cool, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So, but these aren't the earliest ones. You know, these the, well, are just the, these are the earliest the ones that we can see. These are the, we believe these were the first stars right, okay. that have gone on and evolved. So although what we're seeing now in these galaxies are the subsequent generations. Right, of course. they're Be saying yes. was kind of you, you rewind when were the first stars formed such that the galaxy can oh, be I how see. it is today. Yeah, yeah. Because, of course, I mean, in my mind... The earliest stars and the earliest galaxies, if the stars aren't around anymore, the galaxies aren't around anymore. But it doesn't work that way, does it? <laughs> stars die and create new stars. That's yeah. what stars do. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so it's quite cool. That's wild. And I think what's the most exciting part of all this is that all this relies on really precise measurements coming from near-infrared to infrared sort of observatories. We've just launched one of the, or definitely the best infrared telescope that we have ever even conceived of having. Turns out, yeah, we've got one of those and it's currently gearing up to do its thing. As we said at the beginning of the show, the JWST is aligning all of its bits in the right direction. So mm. 
So presumably it'll be able to weigh in. This will be a good thing. Absolutely. It's one of the main science goals of James Webb Space Telescope is to see, can we get more information about these early stars? Can we find galaxies at more distant redshifts? Because we're now in a place where we can see. Like Hubble doesn't really look in the infrared, which is right. where you need to be for these really red galaxies, redshift. Um, so Hubble's only gone to this kind of 11 point whatever redshift. But if you've got a telescope that's designed to go down and also a lot bigger than Hubble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so how, like, what, what are the parameters on what we think JWST can do? I'm not sure exactly numbers wise, but I'm guessing we can push this Z down quite significantly. And if we can discover more galaxies, then, OK, they did, they did a really nice job. They've got six independent high ridge of galaxies to put this work together which is really nice cause that's, and that's amazing and incredible yeah. work but it is still only six it's only six <laughs> you know, and they're only for you know from nine statistics. to eleven yeah. in, in redshift so you can imagine you possibly going down to 12 etc plus mm. plus plus still, mm. and getting more galaxies just keep pushing that back and getting more and more mm. super exciting i can kind of see why the world of astronomy is kind of a bit excited about this telescope and everyone's still just holding their breath please yeah, and that's just one little aspect of what James Webb is doing. Yeah. You know, that's just that's just the the cosmic dawn part of its mission. So cool. Well, Emily, if I wasn't already super excited about this little spacecraft, large spacecraft, it's not little, uh, out there at L two currently unfolding itself, stretching in the cosmic void and beginning to, we hope, look out into space and measure stuff better than we've ever measured it before. I certainly am now, and the JWS team just deserves the biggest standing ovation when all of this gets up. If all of this gets up. When it all gets up. It's really exciting. It's it amazing is. stuff. Yeah, we're taking sweepstakes now from what James Webb Space Telescope's first image you know the first big public image that it puts oh. out is going to be is it going to be one of these super super distant like the yeah. most distant galaxy we've ever seen like before? what would you choose what do you yeah. choose because the astronomers and the pr people are going to be all over this going no we it's got to be this no it's got to be this yeah it's going to be fascinating is it going to be a galaxy is it going to be a planet yeah. is it going to be well, do, do you know what Hubble's was? What was the equivalent for Hubble? It must have been something amazing. I know that one of the very early ones was Whirlpool right, um, right. Galaxy. Which is, you know, is amazing I'm not image. sure if that was first first, but definitely it was one of the yeah. very, very earliest ones. Yeah. yeah, I mean, James Webb's going to have to be something which just knocks your socks off. So yeah. That's cool. That's cool. And then you get that out of the way, and then all the astronomers go right down to work. Let's yep. do this thing. That's very cool. The other thing I'm really looking forward to is working out what the acronym for your baby name is going to be. <laughs> I think that's great. I think you should just tell people that it is an acronym, but not tell them what it is and let them work it out for themselves. Listen, listeners, if you have a good acronym for a baby name, then why don't you write to us and get in touch and tell us what it is. Emily, how, if people wanted to send you baby name suggestions, how would they do that? Well, fortunately, most baby names will fit in the few characters that you're allowed to have on Twitter. Yes. And I mean, not, I think if you're going then... beyond that, oh, look, I'd love to see it. Anyway, split it over a couple, do a, do a thread. <laughs> what are we on Twitter? So we are at Pod. so S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y-P-O-D. That's correct. You can also get us in other ways with that same handle. Yeah. There's the Instagram. Mm -hmm. There is, well, if you shove it into Facebook, then you get It'll turn up. It's something. Yeah, yeah. There's a lovely website. That's right. Syzygy.fm with all of the past episodes. And there's a contact page where you can get in touch with us. There's also the great wall of thanks for all of our supporters, both financial and otherwise. And if you want to become a financial supporter, you can head over to patreon.com and uh, patreon.com slash syzygypod. There it is again. Um, and you can become a financial member. You can throw a couple of dollars or a couple of quid our way every month to help us keep the electrons flowing through the podcast. But other ways you can support the show is just tell everyone that you know that the thing is on and we talk about amazing things like the beginning of the universe and baby stars. Crazy big baby stars, actually. That one's still swimming around my head. So tell everyone you know and help us to rise up through the noise. Give us a review, give us a rating, throw us some stars and other people will find out about what we do. But otherwise... We'll be back again in a week or so to continue this stream of baby-related stories here on Syzygy. Emily, any ideas what the next one should be? We've done Baby Universe, the baby, the first baby stars, 
What's well, next? I think we're sort of naturally going into the first baby galaxies. It kind of does look that way. And again, I'm still trying to figure out, like, what even does a galaxy mean at that point? But yeah, we'll find out. Join us again for the next episode. Emily, I'll catch you in a week or so. See you later. Bye, everybody. <laughs>